Our next session is on the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and we wanted to give you a little bit of 101 background on how it's administered. And um, we've, you know, we've talked about this and uh, the challenges that uh, states are going to have um, getting these funds on the ground with, you know, the hit to the state state budgets and local budgets um, from the COVID-19. And and this is coming, you know, at the same time where, where states are going to have 30 percent more funds from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So um, it's a good problem to have, but still one, one we you know, thought would be helpful to, to, um, to delve into and figure out ways that we could help get those dollars on the ground. So first we're gonna ask Doug Aiken to speak and I'll just give you a little intro on him. He's been involved with parks and recreation and conservation at the state and national level. And he worked with the uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund for 40 years. So he's a font of knowledge. So um, make sure you ask lots and lots of questions. Um, he was an educator at the high school, college, and university le level, um, state park director in North Dakota and Missouri for a total of 28 years. And he's in his 11th year as executive director of Nesorlo, the National Association of State Outdoor Rec Recreation Liaison Officers. Um, he's also served as, as an appointed official in the administration of eight governors and was a cabinet official in, thir uh, in 13 of those years. So he's going to be joined by Lauren Ingram, Imgrund, who is from Pennsylvania and a member of our network. She's the Deputy Secretary for Conservation and Technical Services at Pennsylvania's Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, and there she manages Pennsylvania's nationally recognized conservation landscapes program. Um, since, uh, in, in, since 2011, which she was the Bureau of, um, the Director of the Bureau of Recreation and Conservation. And the Bureau builds connections between citizens and the outdoors through recreation enhancement, natural resource conservation, and community, community re revitalization efforts. Um, it also partners with communities and organizations across Pennsylvania to provide grants and technical assistance, uh, support for local recreation projects, trails and greenways, heritage parks, open space, river, river conservation, and environmental education programs. So, um, and Lauren is also the immediate past president of Nesorlo, where she represented all the states in the successful campaign to permanently reauthorize and fully fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So we're, they are going to be giving us a background on administration of the fund and how um, you know the, your offices can help and get involved and grow some partnerships. And um, then we're going to hear from Joel Lynch. He's the chief of state and local assistance uh, uh, program division at National Park Service. He's worked there for 20 years. And um, that his division administers two active programs, including the Land and Water Conservation Fund's state and local assistance and federal um, lands to parks, which both support the creation and protection of close to home recreation opportunities in communities across the United States and its territories. So without further ado, Doug, I hope you're on the line so we can hand it over yep. to you. I, 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 oh, hi, can there you, you hear, go. Yeah, yes. can you hear me? Yep. Um, Lauren and I talked about uh, this presentation and Lauren is involved on a day-to-day -day basis with the Land of Water and many other grant programs. And we thought she'd be the best person to make the presentation. Um, uh, I'm gonna watch the chat uh, line for you and, and answer any questions you might have because I believe we're gonna do the presentation and then take questions later, correct? So with no further ado, uh, you're gonna hear from one of our best, Lauren. I think you'll have to share screen or are you gonna work just off your uh, computer? I don't know if you're gonna do that or not. Uh, you guys have the slides, yeah, right? Are you gonna, yep, yeah. there we go. Super, okay. thanks. Good. All right, well, um, good morning or afternoon or wherever, whatever it is where you are. Uh, really happy to be with you today uh, to talk about the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And I know um, many of you have been involved over the past few years in working for permanent reauthorization of the fund and also full funding. Um, and, you know, it is a really a critical resource for states and local governments and communities um, to get outdoor recreation on the ground. And so what we're going to talk about a little bit today is a little bit, bit about the history of the fund, uh, kind of where it originated, and then uh, how it's administered, a pretty high level of how it's administered, 
And I'll talk a little bit about some things in Pennsylvania. Um, and there, it is different in different states. And we do also have um, in this session, and he's going to be following us af after we speak, Doug Beck, who runs the program in Maine. So you have lots of uh, resources here on the line and, and maybe others who are involved as well. So um, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, I always like to go back to the beginnings and, and how things were created and sort of looking at the sideboards um, to programs as, as we look at them sort of in, in modern days. Um, and the Land and Water Conservation Fund, as I, as I said, is, is an old program that was being given new life with the permanent reauthorization and the permanent funding. But it actually grew out of a, uh, some information and some details that are, are interesting and could be revisited today. Um, and that is that Congress in the late 50s established an outdoor recreation um, sort of tax task force. It was a commission to review things um, across the country and assess the country's outdoor recreation needs. It was a time of um, change in the country. Maybe we could even say a time of strife, uh, perhaps a little bit like right now. And uh, Congress recognized that uh, outdoor recreation might be a great way to help us um, to move forward as a country. And the commission uh, released a report that called for the establishment of a national recreation program. And one of the major things that they uh, asked, or asked to Congress to establish was a federal program to provide grants to states to assist them in recreation planning, acquiring lands and developing facilities for outdoor recreation. And out of that grew the Land and Water Conservation Fund which as you know, also has a, an extremely important federal side to the program, which is focused on land acquisition. But the state side program is focused in those three areas that I just mentioned, planning, acquisition, and developing facilities at the state and local level. So the money primarily comes from offshore drilling royalties. There's some other sources um, and some additional sources for the state program through Gulf of Mexico drilling. And, and uh, certainly Joel can speak to a lot of these things as well, since he's the one who runs and spends all this money um, <laughs> or may helps us spend it all. Um, so uh, as you know, it is authorized at $900 million a year and has been for quite some time, but that amount of money has not been uh, actually appropriated for a long time, but better days ahead because it now has a mandatory funding requirement under the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, Another sort of little tidbit of history is that uh, when it was first enacted, 60% of the funds were to go to states. Um, that guarantee was removed in the 70s. Um, and uh, there was uh, many, many years of extremely low funding to the states. When I started in Pennsylvania 15 years ago, we were getting about $900,000. Um, and at the height of the program, prior to that, you know, we were getting eight to 12 million, uh, which is back to what we're gonna be at again. So, you know, one of the things to recognize as we move into uh, the state spending this new money is that they are coming off of years of really low uh, funds to the program. The past few years have been pretty good, so we're ramping back up, but states really have, um, they're gonna need to really up their game on this program and, you know, it, because it was so poorly funded for, uh, for years. Um, the Dingle Act does require 40% of the funds now to go to state uh, programs, um, and that is primarily the state and local assistance program, including the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program, which is managed by National Park Service uh, and implemented at the state level. Um, so that, at that 900 million, the uh, allocation of those funds between the different LWCF programs will be determined by um, the administration and Congress uh, each year, but they will have to allocate that whole 900 million. Okay, so moving on to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna to focus today, we're gonna to focus today on the state and local assistance program. And that program is managed on the state level uh, by folks like myself and uh, my colleague Doug Beck, who's here, 
uh, and we work with the National Park Service at the regional and Washington level uh, with Joel's staff all across the country. Um, and we're all appointed, the people who run the program this are called state liaison officers, and we are appointed by our governors. Um, and the funding is allocated to each state by a, by a formula. Um, and that takes into account a number of different things and maybe Joel will talk about that when he speaks, but it is a, it is a formula-based program. In order to remain eligible for this program, each state does a comprehensive outdoor recreation plan every five years. And you see a shot here of Pennsylvania's uh, most recent plan, which we're, we're, we just finalized this past year. Um, so all the projects that are selected and the funds that are awarded have to be in alignment with this uh, outdoor recreation plan. And there's lots of ways for the public and for uh, organizations and, and businesses and so on to be involved in the public input process into the development of that plan. And that's a key thing for you all to remember because that's a way to um, influence the kinds of projects that the state will eventually select and fund in, at the state and local level. So it's an open competitive selection process. Um, there's, I hope these numbers are right, but there's been over 46,000 projects and over $8 billion over the history of the program. And this all results in uh, a national network of pre federally protected parkland uh, owned by state and local governments. And I'll get into that protection in a moment. As I mentioned, there is also a national competition the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program that is for urban areas, that is uh, um, managed at the federal level and then the states will be imp or implement that. And there is a lot, lot, lot of money in that one uh, this year's budget. I think it's 125 million. Congress chose to put a great deal of money in there. So that's a really important one to keep an eye on. So I can have my next slide, please. Um, so what kinds of projects are eligible? Again, they have to be outdoor recreation focused, can be land acquisition, purchasing land for new parks or expanding parks or trails, um, development projects, boat ramps, new playgrounds, new baseball fields, new trails, um, so on and so forth, all kinds of things for outdoor recreation. Um, major rehabilitation or renovation of outdoor recreation areas. So money cannot go for maintenance, um, that's the responsibility of the project sponsor, but it can go for uh, a major rehab of a park. And I know in Pennsylvania, that's been our focus for the past few years. And we're going to, with this new money, actually really ramp that up because we have uh, thousands and thousands of sites that have previously had uh, LWCF investment. And we want to get those up to uh, new standards and, and new facilities. Um, and then you can also have a combination project that both uh, combines an acquisition and a development. So who's eligible? Um, again, it has to be a government entity, state government, county, local governments, uh, and school districts are el also eligible for this funding. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. So what are some of the sort of nuts and bolts of the program requirements? It is a minimum of a one-to-one -one match um, and states uh, have different requirements around match and there's different requirements at the federal level. Um, doesn't always have to be cash. Um, in Pennsylvania, we almost do usually require cash uh, because of the way we run our program and we have a significant state program where we allow um, in-kind costs. Um, but that can also be allowed uh, through LWCF. Another really key thing about this program is once you've made an investment in that property, whether it's a ball field like this one or a playground, that entire park is federally protected. You cannot convert it to anything that's non-outdoor recreation use. And that goes back to the intent of the program to create outdoor recreation spaces all across the country for close to home uh, recreation. Again, as I mentioned before, the ongoing maintenance operation and the assurance of it being open and accessible to the public is a uh, responsibility of the state and the local partners. The state is to be doing five-year inspections of those sites to assure that they remain in outdoor recreation um, and they will uh, you know, reach out to communities if there are issues there, things that we call conversions of use. Another key thing about the program, it is, is an all reimbursement program. So 
the entity that gets the grant has to have the cash up front in order to uh, build the project, develop the project, those kinds of things. Um, and then they'll get reimbursed um, through the state and the state gets reimbursed by the federal government. So moving on to my next slide. Um, so controlling documents, I just sort of put this in here, you know, all this good bureaucratic stuff that makes sure that we're um, keeping these projects uh, in, in line with what, what is required. And I put the numbers there, the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act, um, the specific section that's about financial assistance to states, and then the regulations for the post-project compliance. That's what I was mentioning about the permanent protection on these sites. Move on to my next slide, please. Each state is also gonna have its own grant manual and the uh, things that it requires, um, some of which may be in addition to what the National Park Service requires. And then there is a controlling grant manual that the National Park Service is in charge of that is available for anybody to see. It's online and you can look at that. Um, each entity will have a grant agreement with the state. Um, and there, again, there's strings attached to that. There's things that you have to follow, very similar to many other federal programs. Uh, following open and um, competitive bidding processes, those kinds of things. Um, there'll be uh, the grant application project package that you would have to fill out, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more, and then also the LWCF project agreement, that's your agreement with the National Park Service. Moving on to my next slide. Again, I'm hitting home on this a lot about the permanent protection, but I think it's really important because it does uh, influence the kinds of places you might want to put this money. Um, and I put a project here uh, that's gonna be done in phases in, in the city of York and Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, they <clears throat> will have to put this whole area into what's called 6F protection. Um, so <clears throat> again, you wanna really think about that when you're working with partners on these projects. Uh, and there is a map that goes in the file and that uh, site inspection that I talked about that's done every five years, the folks that are doing that inspection, in Pennsylvania's case, it's our staff that goes out and do that, does, does those inspections. They'll take, take that map along with them. We actually have a GIS system. I'm acting like it's a paper map. It actually isn't, but um, they uh, go there and they look at that map in, in uh, conjunction with um, uh, what was developed there and where the boundaries are of the, of the area. So moving on to my next slide. Um, so this is a sample type timeline. And uh, if you'll click it, yeah, okay, it does, it's a little, I didn't do this. It's got all this cool anim animation on it. Um, so this is a sample timeline from Pennsylvania for our grant program. And in Pennsylvania, we have a significant state grant program as well. And what we do is we put all of our funds together. We have this last year, we had about $56 million in grant awards. That's a com combination of land and water conservation fund, two state, well, actually three state sources of funding and the federal recreation um, trails program. So we have folks apply to us um, for our grant program. And then we select which projects we're going to forward on to the National Park Service for LWCF uh, consideration. But this gives you an idea of the time that it takes from, at least in Pennsylvania, from the time that you apply um, until the time that a project would actually begin. So it takes a while. Um, and again, this is an example for our uh, grant round coming up here. We do workshops every fall to help folks get ready and figure out how to put their first uh, best foot forward. Um, we can go, yeah, go back. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then we have an open grant period, January to April usually. Then we review and rank all our applications, try to announce in the fall. Um, once we make those announcements, they're tentative announcements for LWCF funding. And then that package goes to the National Park Service for final approvals. Uh, so those steps would happen there between the fall and the earliest that the project would begin. And there are grant windows for the National Park Service funding. So we have to work around those as well. Um, but that usually works out okay for our, our program. So uh, you can go to the next slide now. Uh, so what kinds of things do people use for grant criteria? I mean, again, it has to tie back to the SCORP. This, um, which is the plan that we do every five years, you can see here in Pennsylvania, the kinds of things that we score on. 
you can click one more time, I think I get a bunch more points coming up there, yeah. So we look at things like how ready to go is the project? In other words, are we gonna be, is it, it when we fund it, will it be able to start in a year when, um, you know, when we're uh, able to make the award? So that get, has a certain amount of points to it. You can see the other ones here, they're pretty standard stuff. We do have a big focus on climate, gr uh, green and sustainable pr practices. We also have a big focus now through this REC plan on access for all, which is really our DEI component. Um, and focus on ADA, of course, public involvement, the outdoor recreation plan, it's all through here, but we ask people to specifically address one of our um, recommendations in the plan in this, in this number five here. So one or more, you know, so how is this, you look at that and you say, yes, this is going to help implement, you know, X, Y, and Z recommendation in the outdoor recreation plan. So Lauren, let me just ask you about the, that, that slide sure. right there. Is this Pennsylvania specific? Does each does each state make their own um, you know process or and, and have their own criteria and the different rankings? Correct, correct. Yeah, this is Pennsylvania specific. Okay. So each state would have its own criteria um, and own ranking system. Yep. So yeah, don't think that you're going to go to I don't know Kansas. I don't know what their criteria is. It wouldn't necessarily be like this. So. I just wanted to show you some example, you know, an example, so you had a sense. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the next one. Thanks, Bevins. Great question. Um, this is a um, project completion timeline for you. Again, Pennsylvania specific, and this would be for a project to develop a park. Uh, a project where you're going to actually buy property would maybe have a slightly different timeline, but I just kind of wanted to show you the steps. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, once you go through all those steps with us, then there's the review and approval by National Park Service, as I said, then our contracting process, we send a letter out um, and we, and again, this is specific to Pennsylvania, how this works. We have, we have a pretty big staff that runs our grant program. We have about 38 people, which is one of the bigger ones in, in the country. Not the biggest, but one of the bigger ones. So, you know, we have, um, a fair amount of hand-holding that we're doing with our folks to make sure that things go through. So we'll talk to the um, grantee uh, ahead of time before we even do the final contract to assure that we're on the same page with the scope that we've agreed to, because sometimes people will apply for more money than we give them. So we want to, we may cut the scope back on what they've applied for. Um, once people get the grant, we require a number of steps for review. Uh, we review the uh, design for the project to assure that it's meeting things like ADA, uh, et cetera. Um, and we provide input into that um, and help people think through some of the best uh, ways to design their project. They, most all of them work with a design consultant, a landscape architect, an engineer, those kinds of things. But we provide input into that. Um, once that's done, then folks can go out and advertise and bid their project again. Uh, you know, it has to be open public bidding, those kinds of things. Um, we review those bids in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then once that's approved, they can go out to bid, they build the project. We come around and do a final site inspection. And then we uh, submit all the stuff to National Park Service. Um, and uh, they can get payments along the way. <clears throat> as, we, as I mentioned, we do do reimbursement, but it has to be payments up front. Um, next uh, slide, please. So all that, and I know it's a lot, but I want you guys to just kind of get a sense of the process um, and, uh, you know, the, the time involved in it and those kinds of things. I and mean, it's a fabulous program, does fabulous work on the ground, but like all these, um, all these things, you know, there's hoops to jump through. So, you know, how could we all in the states use the, the help of the outdoor recreation offices and how can you get things that you're interested in in seeing happen uh, on the ground? Um, the number one thing, one of the number one things is to participate in that score planning process. So every state does one every five years. It's required to have public involvement. So figure that out and, and get involved. In Pennsylvania, we have a technical advisory committee that we convene uh, that includes representatives from many uh, different sectors. Um, and we also do a number of surveys. And I know other states do the same thing. So the other thing, and there's a lot of talk about the need for matching dollars and the need for capacity at the local level. 
and I know Doug Beck is going to talk more about partnerships later, but one of the things is, and one of the things that we know, despite having a, you know, a good staff that helps to, helps to run this program, is that communities need help. You know, we need folks who are out there helping them figure out how to apply for the money, helping them write their grant proposals, helping them come up with a strategy for match. You know, local governments at the rural and urban level are stretched, are, they need help. And, uh, you know, you can really be effective by um, working directly with them on, on applying for programs like this. And I think that's a really uh, great role that <clears throat> folks in, in, in other programs in state government can do to help with land and water conservation fund implementation. And then finally, and uh, then I'll turn it over to Doug, if you can move to my next slide. Um, the Sorlo, and Doug can talk more about this as well. We have a number of administrative things that we'd like to see to help improve the program. We're working with our friends and our partners at the Park Service on these. Some of them require uh, legislative changes and we will be pushing for those. We have submitted all of this information to the Biden transition team. Um, so we'll see, uh, but we'll continue to continue to work on these areas that we need to improve the program. We'd like to move that outdoor recreation planning process to a 10 year cycle. As soon as you start to plan, it's ready to go again at five years. Um, we would like to have more decisions delegated to the regions and state level that could be more quickly acted upon. Um, speeding up the apportionment process. Remember I told you earlier, it's based on a formula. Um, it still seems to take a really long time to get it through interior. Uh, we really want to see that speed it up. Um, and then there's some things around the conversions we want to be able to move. There, there is a way I, I mentioned, I didn't really say this, but if there is a non-outdoor recreation use proposed for a site, there is a way to convert that site um, to non-outdoor recreation use. You have to have replacement land for the land that's been taken out of service. And there's a bunch of hoops to go through with that. Um, it's a hard process, rightly so. Uh, but there is a way to do that. Um, there's also, uh, so that's addressing those issues there. Um, and then we asked for some specific things because of COVID-19 and the, and the pandemic, uh, reducing the match to 20% from 50 for a uh, tempor temporary time period um, and extending the obligation period to five years. We also really, really need um, the ability to have an administrative fee uh, component of this, uh, many states, I mean, including Pennsylvania, you know, we're all budget strapped and many states, this is their only grant program. They have one or a half a person trying to run the program. But, uh, and, uh, you know, we really need like other federal grant programs to be able to have that flat administrative rate. We do have the ability to do indirect costs, uh, but we would prefer to have this flat administrative rate like um, rec federal recreational trails. So again, I hope this was helpful. I'm gonna turn it over to Doug for some comments about the Sorlo. Questions too. Um, and on that last point where states can use 10% of um, the annual appropriation of, uh, for administration, um, we got a question from Tara McKee from Utah. Hi, Tara. So she uh, wanted to know um, how much time it takes to um, to visit and um, you know check up on these sites that have to be checked up on every five years. It seems like there's a lot of paperwork, and plus doing the scorp and there's um, not maybe no money or not or is money given for the for the verification or um, no? There's no money for yeah. post completion. Uh, Okay. Post, there, there is not. There is money right. to do the SCORP, yes. You can get right. a grant for that. Um, and Doug Aiken is suggesting that Doug Mac Beck might be good to answer this particular question. Okay. Um, so if he's... All right, he's on the line. I see him in the chat box too. So we'll, we'll hold that for him. But uh, they should also want to know like how much time it takes your staff person to go out and you know verify these projects every five years. So I'm sure it's not like something you do every five years. It's a rolling thing. But how much staff... Uh, you know, how many staff do you have doing it and how much time does it take? Yeah, so Pennsylvania has um, nine regional staff mm -hmm. and those people are who do the site inspections and we have set them up on a five-year five year blocks. Mm -hmm. So every year we do a fifth of them. Mm -hmm. um, we have also uh, 
right now we're not allowed to hire any interns, but we have hired interns mm -hmm. to help us with those. Um, and we do have a uh, electronic system that we use so that they have, it's kind of cool. I mean, they can get like a kind of a map of driving directions to get all to the sites mm -hmm. because that's part of the problem. They're like all over this place. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes a lot of time. And I, I, uh, I don't know the specific answer to that. But so you it have takes nine full time people, and that's their job, like hundred percent of their job, or is it is a percentage of their job? It's a percentage of their job. So as I mentioned, we have a a big grant program, um, and those people, those nine regional people, work with communities uh, on technical assistance for applying for our program and other programs. They help them with outdoor recreation planning. Mm -hmm. So no, it's a, it's actually a pretty small component of it. Um, we have one person who manages the program overall uh, and manages most of the grants, but the site inspections happen to be done as a component of those regional folks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then Doug, you had had, had some um, comments in the chat about that, about um, you know what you found with Nasorlo, like how many people yeah. had generally. Yeah, Doug, Doug Beck did kind of a cost uh, um, assessment of that, a cost benefit analysis. And I think uh, Doug, you can address that, but it was a minimum of two people, one person in a state, and the only thing they did was inspections and dealt with 6 ec conversions, mm -hmm. not even involved in the grant process. Because mm -hmm. in a state like North Dakota, for example, where, where I was, well, Missouri is the same way, the physical distances are great. North Dakota has about 1,400 projects. You divide that by five, mm -hmm. and then you uh, have to drive all over the state uh, uh, inspecting these, it gets to be quite a chore both mm -hmm. and expense, travel and all that. So uh, it is quite a uh, commitment. And I think that's the basis of our recommendation on the uh, uh, administrative fee is to have enough resources to be able to comply with the law <clears throat> and fulfill yeah. our obligations. I mean, again, you know, it it um, it is an important program that's putting all these great resources on the ground, and we want it to be. We want the sites right. to be protected, but there's there is an administrative burden. Now, some states, I think, might have people self uh, inspect. Is that right, Joel? Communities inspect themselves and set, submit the paperwork in. Joel, do you want to join us for the Q and A? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I can respond to that. Yeah, I think there are there are lots of different you know approaches of of how. Uh, such a task of the inspections may be accomplished. And, and there is, um, you know, I, I would say a lot of the methods might be used in combination with, um, you know, physical visits from uh, from somebody, you know, whether it's interns or adjacent mm -hmm. staff or the regional staff, uh, you know, once maybe in a 10 year cycle. Uh, but there are states that do sort of self certifications and, and have the local unit of government um, you know, I don't know, sign an affidavit saying that the, it's all open and available for public outdoor recreation. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but but there are methods like that. Yeah. Um, so also, Lauren, I wanted to ask, uh, pose another question um, from Mary in the chat box. And I know that, um, that Doug Beck's gonna get into this in our next um, session, but they have their main focus, but um, she asked, what's your recommendation on how to best find the local matches for communities around the state? And I, I just wanted to hear, you know, in Pennsylvania, what's, you know, what, what are some of the things you've seen there in Pennsylvania? Yeah, so we've seen people just take it straight out of their budget. Um, mm -hmm. We, uh, CDBG funds are also a common match. Development block grant. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, and then, you know, general fundraising for the project specifically. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Pennsylvania, our LWCF projects tend to be larger. Mm -hmm. So we do have um, in Philadelphia, for example, um, we have, it's a, actually an ORLP grant. And that grant, in that particular case, the Trust for Public Land worked with the city of Philadelphia um, mm. on, you know, helping out with managing that project and helping out with some of the matching dollars. Uh -huh. um, what was the project there in Philly? Uh, it's not done yet. It hasn't actually started yet. So right. I'll have to, I can't think of the name of the park right now. Right. I'm glad you brought that up too, because you had mentioned, you know, you went, you said the OR, the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership 
that that is funded with a lot of funds coming up this year. And I just wanted you to explain what that was too. Yeah. So different I, from the rest of the funds. And yeah, maybe I can get Joel to do that because okay. I think okay, he'd be better at it than me. This part. But um, and also Doug, you had answered a couple of questions in the chat box. Wanted to know if you wanted to uh, expound on them. Um, well, I, I answered a bunch of them, so I don't know exactly which one. Yeah. But I, I wanted to, since a lot of your members are focused on business development mm -hmm. and economic development, I wanted to point out that you know there are businesses that operate within these land and water conservation funded parks. They, they're, they're usually under some type of contract or concession agreement or something like that with the sponsoring entity, but they, but they are required to follow all of the, you know, the uh, access requirements and all of the regulations that, 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 the, that the program operates under. And, uh, but there are state parks, there are regional parks, and I'm sure there are local parks, uh, line of water parks that are uh, sometimes operated by some type of uh, cooperative agreement. And there are facilities that are needed to operate a business that may not be funded, be able to be funded through the land and water program. And that, that, uh, that's another issue that comes up. Not everything that you would require to run a business might be eligible for land and water funds. So, mm -hmm. but I'd be happy to answer any other question you might have and anybody might have. Yeah. I saw a couple other questions yeah, in here. Question um, from Axie in New Mexico about, um, uh, has there been, and this might be, you know, cutting into what Joel is going to talk about in, in, the, in the next, um, you know, ne next session or not, you know, right after you all, but has there been talk of currently adjusting the match requirement to reflect a community's resources and um, at more, to more equi equitably distribute the funds? So I know match is going to be a huge, huge, you know, reach for a lot of places and especially marginalized low income communities, you know, coming up. Um, so well, I can just, there, yeah, there so isn't a the, scale based on the county's meeting household income, for instance. At the I can talk a little bit about, if you want, about what we're going to do in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, so you know, we, are, we do have this significant increase in LWCF funds mm -hmm. and um, we do, we did just complete our outdoor recreation plan where we did a, an extensive analysis of park access and trail access and water access in conjunction with the Trust for Public Land. It's pretty cool um, analysis. Kind of uses park score, but it's a little bit different than that. Anyway, we're going to use that to target some communities that we haven't been funding traditionally that have high need. And we're going to look at ways that we can use our state funding to match the land and water funding so that the local community will have less of a match. Um, so now, you know, we're able to do that. That'll mean our state funding won't go as far, but that's one of the things that we're looking at as a state. But again, there's nothing to say that you couldn't do something like has been, um, you know, you could have a, a huge bunch of money from a business uh, or a small amount of money from a business that could be part of the matching funds. You know, you just have to give it to the government. So um, there's lots of ways to think creatively, I think, about the matching funds. But sort of back to that equity piece, that's what we're looking at in Pennsylvania um, because we do have these, uh, I think we have 1,400 LWCF sites, some of which are state parks. Um, and state, you know, state parks are an absolute place that the LWCF is used. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, obviously, the state itself would be matching the money with its own funds. Mm -hmm. So, Lauren, with um, with the state funds you mentioned matching, I know like Maryland has dedicated state funds, but then there's a match requirement there too. Your state funds have a match requirement, or is that somewhat flexible? Well, they do, but we can the federal money could be that match requirement. See, so we have a fifty fifty. Oh, okay. So okay. yeah, we're. I mean, again, we haven't finalized this, but we're trying. We're trying to be creative. Um, in response to this, to, to what we think is that perhaps we've been investing our LWCF money, as I think I mentioned, we've been, and this is specific to Pennsylvania, other states could be completely different. You know, we've been doing it as big grants and we're thinking of doing smaller grants to try to mm -hmm. 
high need. And that someone, I think, just asked what the, how we define that. And it's defined based on um, economics, racial makeup, the number of kids. Um, and I think it's a five or a 10 minute walk. Again, it's very similar to what TPL did. Uh -huh. um, or we did it with TPL. So we use some of their criteria modified for Pennsylvania. We're pretty excited about it. Um, I'll put in the chat the link to the work that we did after I'm done answering questions. Yeah, great. Um, let's see, um, somebody asked, oh, actually again, how are you defining high need? Oh, oh, what metrics are you looking at? And you kind of just went over that. Were there, was there anything else you said? Um, uh, Bevan, I might add that there are other federal programs that have uh, like the trails program as a 20% match. And I noticed when uh, some of the uh, round table listed a, a variety of projects as priority project, there were several trails projects and they might be better served or it might be easier for them to apply for a recreation trails grant. And uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and the state game and fish have mm -hmm. boat ramp projects and things like that that are at a much, uh, I think they're 20 or 25% matches. So when you're promoting a project, uh, and, and I think you can get this information at the state liaison officer, find out other kinds of grants that might be more appropriate at, at the present time for land and water uh, mm -hmm. than, than the land and water program. Right. And so, and, and one point I think maybe, I don't know if you've already made it, but obviously you can't um, marry up federal grants with federal grants to make the 50% match. Right. Um, well, there are some that are eligible. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, the only one I yeah. know of is, is CBD uh, grants, but somebody indicated that you can use National Recreation Trails funds, but I've never heard of that. Is that true? Yes, you, you can. It is. Uh, so there has to be. Um, so in the LWCF uh, legislation, there is, it calls out that other federal funds can't be used. Um, and there's reasons for that, but um, but there are, um, and I don't know that the two that have been mentioned are probably the core. There's the core two uh, top ones, uh, and then there's at least two or three other ones. Um, and those um, program, the authorizing language actually includes language in in them that that says that they can be used for match with the LWCF assistance program. So that's the distinction that's being made there. Joel, can uh, can we all get a copy of those programs somehow? I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, um, I will talk to Thank my you. staff and because I can't even remember off the top of my head which they yeah, are. Yeah, that's but. fine. But just all right, at some and point. we will we'll definitely share that information with our network too. I've got Timothy and Matt noting down anything that we um, are 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 talking about that we have to follow up on, and so um, we have another question from Chris Perkins, and he said. Um, is there an uh, opportunity to message more effectively to outdoor rec businesses who rely on near nearby resources about um, uh, opportunities to provide private match? So that's a really good question for this network. Yeah, I would think so. I, you know. Um... So actually, um, specifically to Pennsylvania, you said think about examples like the Pennsylvania Wilds region and all the businesses in that ecosystem. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. And, um, you know, one of the things, and I don't, I don't think Gretchen's still on, my, my colleague, she had another call she had to be on, but we are working, you know, we haven't established an outdoor recreation office, but we're sort of nibbling around the edges and we are working, um, you know, hopefully in conjunction with many of you on some ways like that. And we are doing some outreach right now to some businesses, um, specific to our conservation landscape areas of which Pennsylvania Wilds is one. So that's a great point um, and something that we could bring up with them. Right now we're sort of focused the other way, like what can we do for you? But this would be what they can do for us, which would right. be good. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that'd be a really, that's a kind of a unique uh, um, position that our offices are in because a lot of our office directors come from um, you know, associations or industry and they're, they have connections with user groups and they have advisory groups and they have a lot of these connections. So I thought that is a great, um, you know, uh, thing for them to uh, step into to, to get, get all, connect all these, um, you know, sources of funding, private funding with, with either existing partnerships or 
to identify partnerships on the ground that need to come together and just to build them or to grow them bigger. Yeah, absolutely. One, yeah, one of the things, uh, Bevan, that we've been trying to get done for 10 years now is a, a database that identifies all of these parks that have land and water uh, money in them so that private businesses could uh, get oh, okay. access to that information and, and know, uh, find out what the needs are for some of those area or local uh, park projects and, and how they could partner with them. The other thing we've been doing is working with um, um, uh, Wilderness Society and uh, Trust for Public Land about putting together in one place materials that would uh, uh, give ideas on the variety of sources of uh, funds that might be available to match uh, land and water projects, e even mm -hmm. community specific. And uh, PlayCore, which is a function of game time, is has got a database that they're working on. So I think what we're trying to do on the short term is try to mm -hmm. meet and put all of this together and then distribute the information through the variety of groups that are interested now in the land and water program, what it can do. But we haven't, we haven't got that done yet. And you know, Doug, you had sent me that um, PlayCore's um, database. Is that is is that something that we can share with our network? Was that internal or was that something? I mean, I looked no, at it. No, it's it's on the internet. So okay, sorry. Yeah. That, so that's a resource that we'll share with the network. Yeah. After the meeting too. You know, it it it, it, it lists a variety of foundations and funds and that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I do want to turn it over to Joel because we did ask him to talk about um some of the uh, administrative changes of the Land and Water Conservation Fund and uh, uh, some of the things that had cut, come out of this task force after the Great American Outdoors Act was, um, was passed. So Joel, let me turn it over to you now. Okay, great. Um, so I, what I wanted to do, since it wasn't mentioned um, before I even get into that piece of it, uh, was just to talk about um, kind of where what happened with the funding for this particular fiscal year. So that's FY uh, 21, uh, because the 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 uh, decisions, is, the allocation has been in essence made and it was made through um, Congress really driving the bus um, and, and instead of uh, the administration. So the way the process going forward will work under the Great American Outdoor Act was that the uh, administration would propose through the budget process um, and then if Congress, that's not quite all, I'm quite all I have it in my head, but as Congress um, debates the uh, individual bills or the bills for the um, for funding the federal government, uh, that they could either accept or have an alternative distribution of the $900 million. Um, so there is gonna be always that process where Congress is gonna weigh in or at least be the check and balance to a particular administration. So this year um, they chose to um, have the, establish the, the um, um, the allocation of the $900 million. And I wanted to make some points about that because I think in this sort of inaugural um, year where it, uh, this $900 million and the distribution of that, I think some important um, points have been made by Congress and that may uh, lead us down a very positive path uh, going forward for the indefinite future. Um, and so uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, there were th a total of uh, 360 million of LWCF of that 900 million was actually allocated uh, to the state and local assistance program. And that actually represents 40% of the $900 million to, to the DOT. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And that's consistent with the Dingle Act and, and why I think this is important. And I think many of you are sophisticated enough to understand, you know, how you, you, we have legislation and you look at legislation and uh, any good lawyer can argue one side and, and then turn around and argue another side. So uh, legislation can be interpreted in lots of different ways. And I think uh, the Dingle Act, which established this sort of proportions between the federal side and the state side, and then 20% left over for, I guess I would say the discretionary sort of pot or to put it towards other programs uh, that aren't maybe traditionally funded under land of water. So that 40% uh, was directed uh, to the state assistance program. And I think that's pretty significant because in the past, and potentially obviously going forward, uh, the, the state assistance program could receive 40%, but it also could be a composition of um, other programs that are funded from land and water that do provide assistance 
to states, but are not necessarily direct, uh, rel directly related to what we do in terms of the outdoor recreation benefits. Uh, and that, an example would be the Forest Legacy or the American Battlefield Protection Program, which uh, provides grants in, out of the National Park Service to protect battlefields. So a different purpose, but still LWCF funding. So, so I think it's pretty significant that the 40, that the Congress said, all right, the 40% is really going to the state and local systems program to which uh, Doug and, and um, Lauren and, and, and uh, whatnot um, are, are a part of in terms of our partnership. So the second part I wanted to mention too uh, about the funding, and I think this is probably just as significant if not more in some ways. Um, so Land of Water also gets revenues that come from um, um, a, another source called what we call Go Mesa, which is the Gulf of Mexico Security Act. So uh, it was passed in 2016 and it was a certain percentage of the revenues that were directed to the state assistance program for the grant purposes. And, um, and, and that, that funding, um, it's capped at 125 million, although that's just for sort of a phase two element, which is uh, started in 2000, 2016, I think was the year the phase two started. We can actually get more than the 125 million. That's just a technical uh, piece to it. But so that fund, those funds are, are essentially revenues from the previous years are, are allocated to the program and distributed uh, through the grants, as I mentioned earlier, through the formula-based program. So the funds this year were not uh, concluded in that 40%. So I think that's another significant sign from Congress that says those funds, and again, it was it sort of legislation, I think it was in the Dingle Act that basically said that uh, the Gil Mesa funds would be in addition to uh, the LWCF. So you could see that we're building towards uh, more than the 40% in terms of each year having some uh, fairly sizable pots potentially at, at their max level. Um, so what, so just in the numbers that have been settled from the budget um, uh, this year, so for the SL, the state and local assistance program, the 360 I mentioned, 220 million is being directed to what we uh, refer to as the traditional uh, formula-based program. So that's the program that Lauren was just talking about. Uh, and then on top of that, GoMesa, which originally was estimated at 117, uh, the revenues actually came in at 82 and change. So 82 million and change. So the total formula that we're gonna be allocating, the secretary would allocate this year would be um, 300 and, or $302.4 million. And what's uh, to go back to a little bit what Lauren had mentioned earlier, that's the $75 million increase over last year's amount, uh, which is about 25%. So, so I think that's important to know that um, and at any given time. And then in theory, if you add up Go Mesa, if you add up um, the 40% from the 900 million um, and, and you throw in even this notion that, um, you know, so that, 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 that 360, plus the 125 would be um, roughly 485 million that would be dedicated to public outdoor recreation each year. So we're talking you know, roughly around half a billion dollars. So that's pretty significant going forward. Uh, and I just wanna make sure everybody uh, understands kind of how that plays out. So in addition to that, we, met, um, we talked a little bit about the ORLAP program, that's the Recreation Legacy uh, Outdoor Recreation Program. And that, program, Congress, to our surprise, um, had uh, allocated $125 million this year, which is a significant jump. Last year, it was only $25 million. Uh, so this represents, I think, a, a trajectory for where Congress has been fairly popular. It was started as a, um, a budget, uh, a, a two or three sentence uh, um, line in a budget in 2014 to basically create a national competitive program. Of course, that was done during the Obama administration. We uh, modeled it after another program that many of you might know, and that's the Urban Park and Recreation Recovery Program. Uh, so it's got that urban focus um, and, and whatnot. And I think um, this 125 million may be sort of th the third key point. The 125 million may be the, the sort of third key point in that it's probably highly likely um, that this will become uh, to some degree institutionalized and, and authorized. There have certainly been um, legislative attempts, and, and we know of one that will likely be uh, included uh, um, in the new Congress as, as uh, the year wears on for that too, uh, to basically authorize this program. And if it's at that level, it's a, um, it's, it'll be a significant um, 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 program going forward, especially if it's institutionalized as it is now, 
uh, with this dedication towards um, the the uh, urban communities itself. And so that's specific to urban communities that uh, have needs, as, as Lauren had mentioned, um, and that, you know, we often refer to, or at least it's referred to in the sort of common literature as places that have clay deserts, places where communities that don't have park and recreation uh, adjacent to, um, you know, the community or neighborhood type, type park uh, situations. And I think the COVID situation certainly highlighted a lot of that. So there may be a reason why we got the funding at that level this year, uh, maybe because of part of, part of that. Um, so that's the distribution. The balance goes into our administrative funds uh, of that 360. Um, so I think this is pretty significant uh, in terms of what Congress has done, and it may um, sort of shape how things play out in, in the years years to come uh, with this program. Um, I will say that you know that the, to add to this, so the apportionment is based, the formula based. It's it's population based. It's uh, there's an equal distribution. I think Doug. Um, Aiken had put in the sort of formula, the general formula out there. Um, and there are other elements. The other elements have never really been exercised in terms of if you look at the legislation, it's never been really exercised as to how the distribution will work. Um, and it will likely change, or the distribution will change for some states uh, because it's population based. And in theory, uh, once you have our census number uh, here shortly uh, for 2020, so that will um, play itself out uh, in the coming decade too, as well. Um, and I will say the apportionment um, will likely, you know, to, to the point that Lord had brought up um, and the frustration I think that everybody has when it comes to when Congress appropriates, it takes a, a, often a long time to get through the process where the secretary basically allocates um, the formula out to uh, the states and that's done um, as, to the governors and, and it, you know, in any bureaucracy could take a long time, but uh, it's likely <laughs> this administration as it walks out the door uh, will be um, doing that apportionment process. So uh, the states will likely see that uh, probably before the 20th of uh, this month. Um, what else did I want to mention? Um, so th so that's, that's where we are today. Um, and that will likely set the stage for um, going forward, as I mentioned. So uh, Bevin had wanted me to speak to really the administration's effort to implement uh, the program as it relates to the Great American Outdoor Act. I will point out that the Great American Outdoor Act did not really fundamentally change the program in any way from a legislative standpoint, other than you know it authorized the $900 million. Uh, but the administration took it upon itself to, to use this as an opportunity to, um, to identify what it thinks is, is our priorities and changes that the program should be uh, um, moving forward. And so I'll talk a little bit about those and give some specifics uh, or put some specifics around it. And really it comes down to sort of two groupings. There's really kind of, if you look, if anybody can look at the secretary order, it's secretary, secretary order 3388, uh, was signed in uh, November, early November of this year. And one of the tasks of that, um, uh, in that secretary order was to update our manual that uh, uh, Lauren had referenced. Um, and it set forth kind of two different, um, are three different policy changes uh, for how we would treat um, and match. And I'll talk about those. And then the real kind of emphasis uh, or the real bulk of the emphasis is that um, the administration is trying to articulate sort of other priority emphasis areas as, as well. So, so to get into those, and, and, and I think some of this, I think will come as a surprise to a lot of people. Um, I will say that uh, it seems like I'm having daily conversations um, with the leadership within the department and certainly within the Park Service about how this is all playing out. Um, and it's, uh, I will say, kind of almost even a fluid situation, even though um, I think there's, what, a little less than two weeks uh, before the transition occurs. Um, but some of the policy changes that are being pushed forward um, were, and I'll sort of summarize these and, and um, talk just a little bit about sort of where we are with them. Uh, the, there are two that are sort of related basically to land. So the first one was allowing state and local governments own lands that you know, weren't previously used for outdoor recreation uh, to in essence be used and dedicated to those purposes. And, and that would, the value of those uh, lands or that portion of those lands or however it would play out in terms of the park could be used as a non-federal match. Um, and, and then the other one sort of on top of that, so I kind of put these together because they're very similar was that um, um, state government could you know, donate, if you will, 
um, their uh, some state land to its subdivision, so to a local unit of government or or, or whatnot. And then that, that donation would also be counted as the sort of non-federal match, that 50% of the non-federal match. Um, so those these are very interesting changes because they have traditionally been um, prohibited by the program. And, and so uh, from a standpoint uh, of, of uh, the legal underpinnings of a lot of this stuff, this is where a lot of this is going. The lawyers are saying, yes, we can do this. Um, so this is way the thing that it'll be presented at least going forward, uh, even if uh, it doesn't change later out down the road. The other one that they mentioned in the secretary's order that they're emphasizing was essentially counting costs associated with um, the compliance component with any federal grant um, there with any federal resource really uh, there are requirements related to NEPA and Section 106. So um, all those costs and the different costs that go into the permitting, because you know, remember these are um, um, acquisition and, and development type projects, so brick and mortar type things, um, type projects, um, that, that those costs would be used, could be used as federal match, which can already actually occurs. We already allow that. But one interesting spin on that was that they would uh, include appraisal costs or incidental costs associated with the acquisition. Um, and this is one where the LWCF Act has, has, and has always been interpreted as such, has spelled out that those incidental costs, such as um, you know, filing fees or whatever, uh, appraisal costs, et cetera, would, were not uh, permissible costs that would be reimbursed under the federal program. So, so there again, um, this is a fairly significant change for the program. I don't think it represents a great change. You know, I don't know how much appraisal costs these days, but um, it does represent a change it's, itself. So those are the policy changes that um, were in theory uh, to make life a little bit easier. Uh, but the other part that I really wanted to emphasize is there's a series of priorities that the uh, administration uh, is really trying to emphasize. And, and I'll kind of, I've grouped these into two groupings. Um, and I think you'll see a, a sort of common pattern across all of them. The first grouping really is kind of um, related more to the conservation side of the equation um, and I'll just read these. So acquisition uh, projects related to habitat and to support endangered species uh, and, you know, such as the endangered species, species of concern, anything that fits under the Endangered Species Act. And then also the, the state species related to the species of greatest concern. So it, it really is about the acquisition of habitat. Uh, of course, this is, has to have a, a recreation um, component to it as well for it to be eligible in the land and water creating wetlands to provide habitat for recreation, um, which we traditionally have not done the creating part. We've certainly um, acquired lands, uh, wetlands, and, and are utilized in, in various ways for recreational purposes. Uh, creating peace, you know, whether it's mitigation or just outright creation, uh, has something that we've not traditionally funded, but I don't necessarily say it, it couldn't be emphasized as a funding element, um, but, but, uh, but in this case, the administration is pushing that. Um, the other part is, and this is where it's it a little tricky for um, how recreation fits into this, improving big game winter habitat migration corridor habitat and state lands, and that was specifically for areas out west. Um, we traditionally have not allowed habitat improvement type projects unless there was a direct link to the outdoor recreation benefit. Um, so this is, again, a fairly significant change going forward. Uh, stabilization of shorelines through natural oriented infrastructure and techniques. Um, we've done some of those types of projects, not like necessarily standalone type projects, um, but, but emphasizing that as a potential uh, priority in terms of, of, of uh, where the projects are, are, would be emphasized from the states. And then uh, developing sport shooting facilities. Uh, we uh, do that, we've done that in the past, and, uh, and this is an emphasis. So. So there is a fairly significant change here from a programmatic standpoint, uh, emphasizing you know, habitat and conservation oriented kind of things over that of recreation. I mean, I, I think Doug had um, added in, or somebody I thought may, may have mentioned it, that you know, much of what we do goes to most of the grants we do, about 85% of them go to local units of government. And this is your traditional um, close to home kind of recreation, be it pools, be it um, recreation uh, fields, play fields, soccer fields, that kind of stuff. Uh, certainly a lot of um, uh, playground type things. So this is a pretty significant uh, emphasis for the program to sort of steer away from those kind of projects to emphasize the, 
um, the, the habitat and other conservation related things. And then the, the two, interestingly, the two parts that were called out that um, tie in, in one case a little less loosely to recreation. So the first was increasing safety in urban parks, uh, which we already do, but there was a little sort of bent on it and it was, uh, and they, they used the words through facility related security um, installations. So we're not quite sure really what that means other than in our world, um, there's uh, use of cameras and we've gotten lots of questions in the last few years about paying for cameras and we've uh, and those kind of things, and we consider that equipment and not um, um, brick and mortar type things. So we've we've shied away from that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a change, but uh, we certainly have funded different um, projects over the years: lighting, fencing, whatever it might be, to improve safety within urban parks. And then the last one, as it relates to recreation, was enhancing the connectivity between federal, state, and I'd even put local managed lands. Uh, and the secretary's order called out fishing, hunting. Um, and photograph, photographing and, uh, and wildlife observation uh, are sort of the either examples or the specific type projects. So that's the secretary's order. And I, I kind of have, I guess, three points to really make about uh, where this is all going, uh, particularly as the administration winds down and new administration starts up. So um, the administration's intent, as I understand it, in prioritizing these things is really to emphasize these types of projects um, maybe even to the extent of these types of projects over state identified projects. So I think that might come as a little bit of a surprise to people. Uh, I know it is, I'm still struggling with some of the, the direction uh, where this is going. And I will say it is a little still fluid in terms of what will um, play out and how it will be played out. So it's a little bit uh, to be seen as to how this is gonna be rolled out and what this all means. Uh, and then I will say even beyond that, I think this is where the challenge has been in the last couple of weeks and the enormous amounts of time that I'm spending um, talking to a whole lot of people and a whole lot of lawyers, which is um, interesting into itself, um, is that the secretary order, you know, they're going kind of a little bit beyond what they really called out in the secretary order. Um, they have been looking at our manual. They've been potentially looking at a lot of changes and, and it, as it relates to the program and how it's administered and, and the operational piece to it. Um, and, and, and we've had, lots of conversations, a whole gamut of different things. Um, and this is the one of these sort of large gaping holes where I'm not sure where all this is gonna go and what this is all gonna mean. Um, but that all, all relates to updating our manual and, and, and maybe changing some language to make things easier. Uh, I'm not always sure that some of the language that's being suggested is actually gonna make it easier. I think it'll, it'll make it a little bit more difficult. So uh, these are very fluid situations in terms of how this is playing out. It's ongoing. Um, and like I said, with two weeks left, we're not quite sure how much of this will actually get done. But I will say um, the apportionment uh, and, and I mean, we will, we will fulfill our duties uh, because we're driving towards that, which is the apportionment will be released. And then to some degree, a version of the manual with these priorities and these changes will be in there. But I will, as sort of my last point before I open up for any questions, would just sort of asterisk this whole thing to say that, I, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking that that we can guarantee that um, this will stick. So what is said now, um, I might have a different conversation with you all in a month that would say something completely different with the Biden administration having their own thoughts about how this will all play out too as well. So I will just stop there and, and uh, see what questions or- okay, That was a lot of information, Joel. Thanks so much. And I, I mean, I think you answered the question that was in my head with your last statement about, you know, Secretary's order. I mean, how much does it stick after, during, you know, after administration change? So, um, <laughs> yes, it's it's still a fluid situation, I guess, right? Yeah, very much indeed. Uh -huh. um, very much. Um, I, I did have a, a question about the concept of enhancing connectivity between federal, state, and local lands, and you mentioned fishing and hunting. But what does that actually mean? How do you operationalize? <laughs> Does that mean actually connecting the state parks with the local parks or or physically or, or are we talking some other way? Yeah, I think, you know, I, as I as I told our director the other day, I said, you know, you, you all have to explain to me some of these things because we were not part of the development of the secretary's order. So uh, to us, we interpreted that as really emphasizing trails. Um, and okay. we do see a fair number of projects where um, there's an emphasis to try to connect pieces together. I mean, in the area that I live here outside of Washington, D.C., um, there is always activity to try 
to connect communities um, mm -hmm. and to connect parks in particular or facilities in particular mm -hmm. uh, through either acquisition and then trails and et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is a, you know, not unsurprising. We interpret it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the spin on the different activities was um, a little hard for me to understand what that really, what, what whomever created that, what that, what they were really driving towards, but that's how we're, we've been interpreting it. And again, these are something yeah. that we're already doing. Right. And, and back to the policy changes that you first mentioned, the big the three big changes. Um, the first one was allowing state and local governments to um, use land that weren't used for recreation prior to use them as their non-federal match for land. The value of them, correct, so yeah. Walk me through that scenario. So there's, where, um, I'm just trying to imagine how that's. Well, you know, I mean, there's, you know, um, Communities, um, trying to think of a specific example. Uh, you know, uh, there's a fair amount of land, I think even in and around where I live, that's, you know, a lot of it's undeveloped, you know, like oh. bottomlands of, of creeks, that kind of thing, that that may be conservation related. It might be owned by say the water district or whatever. Um, but, but it could be the, those lands that were traditionally, even though there may be some, you know, um, use of them from a recreational standpoint, um, that they could be, uh, you know, turned into um, um, dedicated parkland and facilities to be developed on them. You know, I think of a lot of this is from the 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 um, from a river bottom standpoint. Like floodplains are often fairly popular places to oh. develop recreation because they're flat. You can't develop any. You know, you don't want to develop facilities on them mm -hmm. uh, from homes and businesses and whatnot. Uh, so recreation, it's pretty easy to to uh, replace a bathroom or gold fields or whatever it might be. Uh, so I think that's sort of the intent. Mm -hmm. and, and the way it would be, would be in theory, the match of the value of that land would then serve as, as um, the basis for the non-federal portion of the project. Oh, okay. And could it also be, I, I'm thinking of like, you know, a wetland or like you said, like an inaccessible part of land that's, you know, maybe forested or something like that. Could that wetland but then it has to be connected to some kind of recreation amenity that you're putting in there right yeah, correct i think that the fundamental tenets of the program are not really i mean we're, we're certainly not seeing that they're changing in that that uh -huh. you know, we're talking about public entity we're talking a public outdoor recreation benefit mm -hmm. um and that can be defined in lots of different ways uh and whatnot so so we're so we're not really talking about um you know moving things away from um, more conservation. I think there's, you know, lots of degrees of what that means. You know, you could have land that's, um, you know, maybe not developed in the sense that it provides habitat, but it still provides opportunity and we develop, or someone could develop opportunities for bird watching or trails or whatever it might be. You know, there's a fair amount of that stuff that goes on out there too as well. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to mention, like, if you're not if you're not looking at the chat, I know uh, I just wanted to mention that Doug Doug said that the, this is a major change in policy for the program. They believe that'll um, dilute it and uh, end up with a lot more spending on habitat and dilute fund for outdoor recreation. So that was um, very observant, Doug. Yes, that is absolutely hundred percent true. I don't disagree okay. with you at all. In a nutshell. In a nutshell, I, and and I. I I wanted to ask Joel one quick question Go on ahead. the on the safety uh, issue that's eligible or whatever. You were talking about lights, but when you described it, it sounded to me like you could put a police substation uh, substation in the park. And I know what will happen if that's eligible. You'll end up with all your police stations in parks and oh. use that provision. Well, and, then and, the, and if they do that, is that a conversion or not? Well, that's yeah. So these are the this is the challenge where where we're trying to articulate what this means or how we interpret it as, as the, the, the prep professions and the um, um, managers that are accountable to the program um, and, and, and whatnot. So yeah, you, you could extend this to any, you know, you could say fire stations for that matter um, as well or whatever. So yeah, it, it does open up all these questions that we've wrestled with over the years uh, because I think um, from those of us that really care about park and recreation at the local and state level, um, you know, it, it, the green spaces out there in our communities are often seen as the place for the next school. 
um, and, and other public resources, not that they don't have standing like a police station or, or whatever, but um, it's, it's uh, park and recreation should have an equal footing to some of the other public services that are out there. So that's what we're really wrestling with is what does this mean? And, um, and these again would be significant changes, but I, I go back to that asterisk and say that, you know, what, what we're dealing with now may not necessarily be where, where things play out in the next administration. Yeah, and I, I want to invite the um, the network to just, you know, um, unmute yourself and ask a question. I know Ricky Geese has a question. So Ricky, if you want to unmute yourself and put your video on and ask your question, you can make it a little more interactive. Um, yes, uh, Joel, um, we have a situation here like with uh, Chugach State Park. We have um, lands that have been donated to the park. Uh, to be managed as, as state park lands, but they haven't been officially entered into the park. Um, and we're going through a legislative process where we're doing that. We don't necessarily have projects to match right now, but is there some concept of a, of a bankable LWCF credits for these land additions into the park, which is an LWCF park? Um, so one of the things we're dealing with is a 6F conversion with a with a small community park, which is non-contiguous with, with the park itself. And we're, and we're gonna try and work to remove that from the park. So we're looking for additions, but we're gonna have more money um, over and above like a one, 1. 1.5 million um, is, the, is the exchange that we're targeting, but we'll probably have 2 million that's going into the park with about 1.5 million coming out. So we'll have a balance of about a half million dollars. We'd like to bank that um, if, you know, for future projects. And then how long could we do that? Would that be eligible? So, yeah, Lauren, I, I, you know, as we, 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 we struggle with this issue. I, I think there's a good, I think it's a, the, the idea of banking, Ricky, is a good concept, um, but how to do it, um, because, you know, from a conversion standpoint, there's value. And then in the legislation, it calls for the recreation utility piece. Um, and, and obviously it's got a match with uh, a priority and the score. Those are the three components. Um, it, it, it's just challenging. And, and we've been uh, um, racking our mind to figure out how best to accomplish this. So I think these are one of these, this larger question about, this is one of these, I think, larger issues that, that we're from a partner standpoint with you all um, at the state level that we're, we'd like to just sort of keep, keep our head down. I wouldn't say this is like our highest priority for, for fixing and moving full things forward. Um, but this is one of those things that I think we just have to put our heads together and figure out a, a more efficient and effective way to, have, to, to do it than what we've been doing right now. But, it, other, but it's, it's possible, Ricky. Okay, um, one other issue that, that I find exciting about appraisals and, and but um, this has to do with general state land, which there are multiple uses. And when we try and get a trail that connects uh, state park land, because it's already dedicated to recreation, we don't need an easement to do a trail. But in our state, we need easements to do trails on general state land. And there's a lot of expense with that. And that's actually the major hiccup of connectivity. Um, I mean, we have three and a half million acres. We manage as state park land, but there's a hundred million acres of general state land. And a lot of times we're trying to connect trails between units of state parks and national lands. It goes through general state lands, but we have to have an easement and, that, and that's expensive. That's actually one of the biggest roadblocks we have is paying for those easements and appraisals um, and, and getting that all tracked through our division of uh, mining land and water for their easement. So if those expenses could be covered for trails, that, that would be a super help in our state. Yeah, that's an interesting thing because a lot of the easements that we funded in the past have been more um, easements that are, are, are crossing to some degree, you know, a private entity, but if it's a public uh, entity, that, that changes the dynamics a little bit. And uh, yeah, I'll admit that a lot of the um, Western states have some very unique um, <laughs> uh, land situations in terms of how they deal with it, particularly between um, whether state agencies, you know, that might not be nat the natural resource-based state agencies like the state parks or the state forest, but, but the other um, agencies like the school districts or things of that nature. So, um, so again, this is one of these things that I think is now that we're, we have this program um, for the indefinite future where there's gonna be some real funding, I think we, we will continue to work and figure out how best to, 
to deal with these things. And, you know, we, we have in the past shied away from um, easements. Uh, there's been a big push to that. Um, they create lots of challenges and unique challenges unto themselves. So this is, again, one of the one of these areas that I think we just need to sort of figure out how best to um, how best to approach them and, and to do it within the confines of the, of the legislation. Well, thanks, Ricky and Joel. And, and when you two get that worked out, let us know. <laughs> So I just wanted yeah. to um, give us all a pause here and thank our speakers, Lauren and Doug and Joel. Thank you so much. This was really a productive and instructive.